opportunity a few months ago to speak at the Dyersburg, Tennessee lectureship, Phillip Street Congregation. It's well known throughout the Middle Tennessee area. It's a delightful place to be. They're known for training many preachers. Many of their own have become preachers, and they've had others that they have sponsored and sent to training schools, etc. That Sunday, or that uh, night, I rather, I had left my Bible down at the front, and after talking to various ones, had gone down to the front to get it. The only one that was there was a little six-year-old child, a little girl. She came up to me and she said, you're not our regular preacher. I said, no, darling, I'm not. She said, are you trying to get started too? I told her, I said, no, if I haven't started but now, I'm not going to get started, I don't think. There's just no words that I can say to tell you how delighted I am to be here tonight and how much respect I have for this good church and our workers. Johnny Ramsey is one of my heroes. Maxie Miller, Maxie Boren, and Dave Miller, the combination. Boy, that's some, some more new name. Both of those brethren are my heroes. From their writings, from their preaching, my oldest daughter lives in Lebanon, Tennessee, and she thinks Johnny walks on water. He knows so much Bible. And I mentioned those things to only be able to say those that are here, I hope you treasure and appreciate and respect these good brethren as you work together with them and as you reach the whole world with them. In so many ways that you have of carrying the message of Christ to the lost, and you have that opportunity. But sometimes we become more or less acquainted and to the point of it becoming commonplace. And those of us that have only a few days or a few hours to be here is treasured beyond description. I have close to 200 pictures of this child with me. I have a couple of videotapes if you want to go out in the van after it's over with. I'll be glad to show you. His eye, he's only two months old. His IQ is 172. We've got him enrolled in Harvard. All, I mean, he's nothing unusual about him at all. I don't know of any other child in the world that right now has got our attention so much. And I know that many of you have walked those steps, but just allow me my few minutes, if you don't mind. I appreciate this good church. I appreciate her elders and the lectureship that has gone on now for the 20th year. And thank you for the invitation to, for me to be a part of it. It's an honor to me. And I want to convey also to my elders again and again, and by way of tape recording, they a lot of times get to hear it, but they make it possible for a lot of us preachers to be gone, to be able to exchange, as it were, with other places. Maxie and Dave were at our place last year, last May. And they blessed us by their presence. Our folks are still talking about how wonderful it was for Dave to talk about Joseph and Maxie to talk about Paul. Truly outstanding lessons that have challenged and changed the lives of several of our folks. So I thank you for that and certainly as we reciprocate or as we have the opportunity of doing that, it's special indeed. I don't know where to go with so many different thoughts that's going through my mind. Getting on with the Lord's work. You've been blessed for the last several days to hear various warnings concerning Calvinism, concerning indifference, concerning mediocrity. You've had the privilege of hearing some good men preach on vital and urgently needed subjects concerning the great salvation. As we hear it, it is as if for the very first time the excitement and the joy that we have as children of God to learn of that which our Father has done for us and the Son of God did for us in making salvation possible. And here we are now, 1900 plus years later, and to be able to preach and to teach and to hear and to learn that ageless gospel, that first century message now for the 20th, nearly the 21st century, as we talk about the problems that the church faces, truly they are many. But it's always been so. As we look at 
the book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, as we talk about the Galatian brethren, 1 Thessalonians as well, and the resurrection subject, many of the congregations in the first century and the problems that they had. Are we any different? No. Or our problem may be a little bit different, but it's still problems nevertheless. And we need to address them, it's true. We need to have warnings about them naturally. There are those that are yet young in the faith that need to be taught about these matters. There are those that are older in the faith that have their roots down deep and understand fully that which has taken place, that which is presently taking place, and the Lord giving us additional time, that which will continue to take place, but it doesn't change that which we must do. You see, as we look to the various admonitions from the holy inspired Scripture, we still hear the words of the Apostle Paul when he says, press toward that prize of the high calling. When he spoke about his own life and he said, I fought, I finished, I've kept, and I know that there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 6, 6 through 8. We hear the words also of Simon Peter when he tells us that we're to add, as it were, the Christian graces in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 to go on and learn, as it were, the knowledge that will separate us and add that of the knowledge as well as the Christian grace. We further hear the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3 concerning that of being a good soldier. And we're to fight a good fight. We're to hold fast. We're to stand fast. We're to be strong and courageous. We're to put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 through 18. So many of these particular scriptures relate and certainly we've heard before and we hear as additional exhortations even this very moment. Is that all there is to Christianity? Is it merely just a matter of fighting? And are we talking about fighting in the way that we sometimes relate or think of the word? You see, in our world today, we hear various ones say, let's get along. Let's, let's not make waves. You know, I don't want to upset my neighbors, my family members, or my friends at work. And, and besides, who am I to judge? You see, sometimes these mindsets of Dale Carnegieism or Norman Vincent Peale or Billy Graham and the various ones that have influenced the religious thinking in all of our world, we sometimes see it even permeating the body of Christ. Is this what we should do? Getting on with the Lord's work, is that all that there is to it? I want to suggest to us that truly ours must be a balanced, multifaceted approach. From the very beginning, I make mention of that. And I want to solidify that in our minds as we continue to develop these thoughts. Those Christians in the first century who heard the gospel excitedly, thrillingly, for the first time, those on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 is the record that we have for it. About 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel after Peter preached that first recorded gospel sermon. They heard, they believed, they obeyed, and they were baptized even that very day. They were scattered abroad. They went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8 verse 4 says. But before that and in between Acts 2 and Acts 8, we find that the number grew, multiplied, increased greatly, Acts 6, 1, 6, 4, various other references that we have, how that indeed they went to their friends, their neighbors, their relatives. They could not keep the gospel of Christ inside. They had something that was better than gold. They wanted indeed not only to save themselves, which they had done by the obedience to the gospel, but they wanted their friends and their neighbors and their relatives and everyone to hear this powerful saving gospel message while it is true while we have not gone any further into this lesson than we have let me be allowed to say that we must oppose liberalism we must fight the devil and the various approaches that he has we must indeed stand strong opposing those things that are destructive and distracting and, and, and tearing apart the body of Christ but we must likewise be evangelistically excitedly still carrying the gospel to the whole world. That's our responsibility. That's our opportunity. That is indeed the mission and the purpose of the church. 
standing strong, opposing Satan, but also carrying the message to the lost. I don't know what the world population is now. Five billion, let's say. We talk about millions, and, and I have a little bit of an idea as to how many that is. But billions I can't grasp. And I dare say you can't as well. A mere one billion, they say. That's a lot. Let me illustrate it. It's in the book. If you were to be able to preach the gospel to 1,000 people this very hour, and at the end of the hour, instantly they were removed and another 1,000 were ushered in. And that continued hour after hour after hour, 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week, all the year. At the end of the year, how many would you have preached the gospel to? A little over 8 million is the answer. But you see, even at the rate of 1,000 people per hour, it would take in excess of 570 years to reach the 5 billion that are presently living on this earth. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16. The references that we most of the time refer to when talking about the great commission of our Lord. We have the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ in our hands. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. James says it, that it's able to save us. Jesus, why did He come? He came to seek and to save the lost. He came as the great physician to those that were in need of a physician. Those indeed that had sin that they themselves could not remove. We can't remove that. We still need that Savior. The world needs that Savior. Thus we need to approach our work in the kingdom of God that vein of thought. We must recognize indeed that it's in our hands. That precious song that we've sung before. Into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands the gospel of life. Haste let us carry. Have we thought about, have we really come face to face with the reality that indeed if the world is to hear the gospel it's only because or as a result of our efforts? Satan and his servants will not take it to them. Denominationalism is not taking it to them. Indeed, if they hear before they die, before they draw their last breath upon this earth and they face God in judgment, lost. If they hear that gospel saving message, it may very well only be through your efforts, not mine. What is the Lord's work? Somebody says. I want us to approach. For a few minutes, it this way. You see, we must recognize that though times have changed, very little has changed. First century church, as I referred to a moment ago, and the church that existed at Corinth and, and Thessalonica and various other places, they had problems as well. When we recognize the various resistance of the Jewish establishment, the Christianity, the resistance of, I don't want to change. I'll lose my chief seat. I don't want to do this. Or I'd, I, I, whatever the particular reaction or statements might have been. Just as it is today, so it was then. The resistance to something new. But you see, in that case, something new was Christ and His way that would lead eternally to the home of the soul. It was the Messiah of which we can read about Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah 53, other references. The church, the bride of Christ, Daniel spoke about it as a kingdom. Daniel 2.44, Isaiah 2.2 2 and 3, Joel 2.28. All of these prophets hundreds of years prior to the time Jesus walked on this earth and they were speaking about the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. He will come and now He's here. But the world didn't want it. Many of them resisted, rebelled against it. Didn't want him to even speak. Didn't want his disciples to talk about the Christ. Even after he died and was raised. The persecution that existed in the first century was tremendous. I've been 
in part of the Bible lands. I stood on the floor of that amphitheater, 20 to 25, 30,000 seat amphitheater, that old worn, aged, torn, marble floor as it were. Najati, our guide, told us about the places where the animals were kept. And how that many times the Christians were tied with their hands behind them. Sometimes even their bodies were wrapped in animal skins so the wild beast would literally tear them to pieces. Or was it we? How is it we're suffering? How is it we're called a bone? Persecuted? Deny Christ or die, they were told. Some would die. Unwilling to deny the Savior, the Son of God. Their Lord and Master. They were determined indeed that indeed their life was willing to be sacrificed. Matthew 10 28 declares, Don't fear them that can kill you physically, fear them that can destroy your soul. We have many other difficulties in the first century if we examine it rather carefully. Com communication was not like it is today. Travel from one place to another. When I hear the Apostle Paul asking, as it were, and the, the elders of Ephesus at Miletus to come and, and meet Paul in Miletus, in Acts chapter 20, to know that they traveled in the way that they did, the many miles that was involved. It's not like we get on the interstate and sometimes get a little impatient because the traffic's not going quite as fast as we'd like. Maybe there's too many 18-wheelers in our way. Maybe we pick up the phone and, and the line is busy and impatiently we get perturbed. Maybe we don't get through the very first time when we try to call someone. Folks, we live in a technological age that is phenomenal. When we can get in our computers, set it in front of them, have those processors going and millions and millions of actions or, or increments of action per second. When we can hit a keystroke and that email message literally goes flying out to hundreds of places. When we can put that home page there and it can be tapped into by people around the world. What was it we were saying about being unable to reach the lost with Christ? Compared to those in the first century. Problems existed then. Problems existed in the earlier portion of our time. I remember the 50s in particular. I'm 50 years of age at this point. Born in 1946. My dad was a preacher for many years. Before his death in 1980. I remember the late 50s and early 60s. In western Kentucky. When he would go down on Saturday morning. And on the street corner would meet the Baptist preacher and they would discuss for two or three hours at a time, both of them willing to say, this is what I believe and why I believe it, and discuss it. I remember the radio broadcast back then, thinking that they were going to come take Daddy away. You see, because he loved the truth so much, he spoke distinctively and concisely, loving and kind, notwithstanding. The truth in love, as it were, the idea of standing for the church, the bride of Christ, the one church, the one body of our Lord, and the message of the gospel of Christ. But you see, the 50s, was it any different than that which it was in the first century? For if we use the 50s and the good that was accomplished then, or more importantly, the church of our Lord in the first century, that which they engaged in, that which they did, that accomplished that phenomenal result, what am I talking about? Not only the increasing in number, not only the multiplying, but in Colossians chapter 1 when the Apostle Paul said, the whole world has heard the gospel. Well, how did they do that in less than 30 years? What ingredients prompted that or made that possible? I would suggest a few things that are quite clear as I thumb through and read concerning that church in the first century and how indeed they Turned the world upside down. How that indeed they had all of the world as it were in a stir. What ingredients, what characteristics, what attitudes, what actions. 
possessed, that they possess, that we need to possess as well, that we today may have the same type of results that they had then. Here's a few thoughts that I observe as I read in the Bible about those first century Christians. They indeed believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He wasn't just a Savior of many Saviors. He wasn't just one way of many ways. He was the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. He was the precious Lamb of God. He was the Savior of the world. Those around them were told, unless you believe that He is the Son of God, you're going to die in your sins. John 8, 24. Jesus, through the pen of Paul in Hebrews chapter 11, said, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. They taught that without reservation. They believed not only that Jesus was the Son of God, but that Jesus Christ purchased his church, and his church was the saved body, the saved body, the only body of Christ in which salvation is found, the only religious body in which salvation is found. And we don't need to be ashamed to say that. We need to be willing to declare that indeed in the Bible it it, it, it clearly and concisely states that only those that are in Jesus Christ shall enjoy the uh, the salvation as well as all spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1. That Jesus Christ added the saved to the church. Acts 2.47 And indeed the body, the one body of Christ that he spoke about in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 and Ephesians 4, 4, in the same way that there's one God and one Lord and one faith and one body, and a little bit earlier said the body which is the church. Those in the first century believed without a shadow of hesitation that indeed it was the body, the the powerful, all-saving, in relationship with God. They also believed that this book, oh, they didn't have it in this form at that time, but the gospel message that we can now hold in our hands, that it was the message that was needed, that was necessary to preach in season and out of season. As Brother Marshall Keeble used to say, if they like it, if they don't like it. It isn't determined by circumstances or receptivity or rejection. It is indeed the powerful gospel, and they, they preach that. When Paul or John the Baptist, various other ones, Peter and and John and, and so many of them would stand before those who had power to take their life. But they didn't shirk back and hesitate and say, I'm not sure I want to say anything now. It, it, It would make waves. But rather they would say, it is not lawful for thee to have her. They would declare that which was necessary, that which was needful, that which would help, which sometimes was not that which they wanted to hear. You know, sometimes the things that we need are not what we want. (laughs) I remember years and years ago, my mama used to tell me, you need this castor oil. I didn't think so. And I knew I didn't want it. But she made me have it. She said, it's good for you. Sometimes the medicine the doctors prescribe, sometimes the mechanic gives us a message, you've got to replace this part and it's going to cost three or $400. We don't want to hear that, but we know we ne- need it. It's necessary, you see. Whether it's the lawyer, whether it's the mechanic, whether it's the pharmacy, no matter what it is, sometimes that which we need to hear is not what we want. And those of the first century, by the inspired revelation through these men, the apostles, they heard that which they needed to hear. The preaching went everywhere. The powerful message of Christ. How indeed they taught that this was the means by which you can be saved. They taught about Christ, the Savior. They told not only that He had lived and had died and been raised, but that He was coming again and the people believed it. I wonder... Do we really believe that He's coming again? Do we have faith and confidence that He could come even this very day? Somebody says, oh, Paul, it's been, look at all these years that that have passed. Maybe not. I don't know when He's coming. I'm not about to state a date. We don't know. 
Only the Father knows. According to the testimony in the Gospel of Christ, according to Matthew. But we do know that He's coming again when we must be prepared. And they taught that in the first century. Those first century Christians, they were a great example because they lived pure and righteous and godly lives. They took their lives seriously. Oh, it doesn't mean that they were perfect. None are. And we cannot be as well. But they indeed strived diligently to purge out those things that were unholy, unrighteous, ceasing those practices, the temptations, not living in sin, not living in the flesh, but rather living to the Spirit. In Titus 2, 11 and 12, we are told how that we are to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. In James 1, 27, pure religion undefiled, to live our, and keep ourselves unspotted from the world. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In 1 John 2, verse 15 and 17, we're told not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. In fact, if we have that camaraderie and fellowship with the world, according to James chapter 4 and verse 4, it is enmity with God. It drives a wedge, as it were, between us. They believed indeed they had to live righteously. They had to be as lights to the world. They were the salt of the earth. And as a result, the world were drawn to them. They saw something different. They saw something appealing. Maybe tragically today, the world looks at those that profess to be Christians, profess to be following Jesus Christ, and in some cases, may not see a difference, may not see anything that is really unique or special. May I suggest that indeed they were united. They loved each other. They shared their processions. They remained faithful even unto death. They were determined to be united and stand together and to look to the time of either the Lord's coming again or else their death and departure from this old world of temptation and sin and knowing that indeed to be there was far better. The words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1 was that of for me to live is Christ, I'll live for Him, but to die is gain. And how that indeed that must be our mindset. We must be so determined to live for Christ no matter what comes our way, whatever temptation it may be, to rest assured that according to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, that indeed there will not be more laid upon us, more temptation, but what we'll be able to find a way, more than what we'll be able to go that way and escape that temptation. Our Lord is able to deliver us from temptation and to reserve, as it were, unto that time of judgment. He's going to help and walk with us every step of the way. Matthew 28 and verse 20. So what is the Lord's work? And what must we be about as we think in terms particularly concerning the attaining and maintaining balance? I want to suggest these particular considerations. There must be the willingness to love truth and be in love with it to the point of learning it, making it a part of our life, and obeying it. It is the truth that can make us free. John 8, 32. Setting us free. The truth that is the Word of God. John 17 and verse 17. And as the apostle, as the psalmist David said, very emphatically, Oh, how I love thy law. And in thy law I meditate day and night. Thy precepts are not grievous. How that indeed, oh, how I desire understanding. And on and on and on he goes especially in Psalm 119. Blessed is that man who lives and meditates upon it day and night. We must love truth, the truth of God. But the other side of that is that we must hate error. You see, the Lord's work in getting on with that, putting these things aside, the distractions as it were, presently standing for truth and opposing error, I love thy law, the psalmist said, and I hate every false way. When I consider the enemies of Jesus Christ, those who are teaching doctrines and commandments of men, Matthew 15, 7. Those who have perverted the gospel of Christ, Galatians chapter 1. Those that are no longer respectful of and holding to the faithful word, but rather are taking away from it, adding to it manipulating it in some way, making it a little bit more pleasing, a little bit more user-friendly. 
And I hear the words of Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2 and Proverbs 30, verse 6. That says, add thou not. Don't take away from the word of God. In the very beginning of my Bible, in Deuteronomy, in Proverbs in the middle, as well as in Revelation 22, the end of it, we have the admonition of don't tamper with the Word of God. Love truth and oppose those who have tampered with, manipulated, or in some way substituted in the Word of God. That's balance. Positive and negative. Which is required. And notice also that we're to love the brotherhood. This family of God of which we're a part, treasured fellowship. We have those of like precious faith in which we can extend the right hand of fellowship, in which we can have those that can shore us up and strengthen us during difficult times, times of calamity, times of problems of difficulty. Those that can be there when we need them. Those that we can be there for when they need us. The brotherhood. To love that brotherhood. But on the other side of it, we likewise need to oppose and hate Satan's evil ways and evil servants. I'm not talking about the people, but their ways. Those that have the desire and the longing, their whole purpose, as it were, is to destroy Christ and His followers. According to the statements that are made in Psalm 119-104, the idea of hating those False ways. The servants of Christ. Those that crucify the Son of God afresh. Those that are the enemies of Christ. Do you hear the words? Does it send chills on our body as we think about those, as it were, that would take again the nail and drive the nail into the hands and the feet of the Son of God? Would we do that? And yet when we're perverting the Word of God, when we're destroying Christianity in bits and pieces, action, small, deeds and compromises, that's exactly what we're doing. There must be that balance. Attained and maintained. Loving truth. Hating error. Loving the brotherhood. And hating those that are evil or those that are crucifying the Son of God afresh. There must be that desire of loving righteousness and hating unrighteousness or ungodliness. The Bible is clear, explicit concerning that which is right and that which is wrong. We can understand it. The Apostle Paul declared that without any fear of contradiction. We can know that homosexuality is wrong. We can know that adultery is wrong. We can know that gambling is wrong. We can know, and just go on down the list. How can I know that? You don't find gambling in the Bible, somebody says. We can determine by truth. We can determine by that and discern by what the Lord has told us. We can know what is right and wrong. It isn't a matter of understanding. It's a matter of acceptance a lot of times. And we oftentimes want to dabble around and fool around in in ways of the world. We haven't maybe made the decision like Moses, Hebrews chapter 11, the record of, where he chose to suffer with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We want to just have our cake and eat it too. We want to do what we want to do. Make up our own rules. There must be that attaining and maintaining balance of loving righteousness. Let me illustrate. That means creating for our young people heroes like Abraham, like Noah, like the Apostle Paul, like some of our preachers and elders and faithful Bible teachers of today. I can look at Brother Perry Cotham Know the influence that he has, not just in Grand Prairie, but in Pulaski, Tennessee. Held the first gospel meeting in that building, that assembly building, 1951, when the church at East Hill came into existence. And they love him dearly. And they have a right to. Because a man of righteousness, oh, he's not perfect. None of us are. But to create in the minds and the hearts of our young people that desire of respect and adoration and exaltation. as Oh, I'm not talking about praising man above that which he should be. But at least holding up righteousness. And then being willing to oppose unrighteousness. That's a part of the Lord's work. Standing strong against evil. Being willing to turn the television off, the radio off, 
If indeed it's permeating our homes with filth and degradation that's maybe causing our children to be compromised or causing them to be brought down low. Attaining balance as it pertains to being loving and kind and humble. But you see, it is not antagonistic to be loving and kind and humble and aggressive and militant at the same time. Don't ever think that my Lord was merely meek, that is weak. Don't think that indeed it is antagonistic of each other to have the same qualities. It isn't. My Lord was strong and humble and meek and mild and most certainly loving God. He threw the money changers out. He opposed those and said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites! Were they so? Yes. Was he unkind and unloving and said no? Indeed, in, when we call black, black, and yea, yea, and nay, nay, we're trying to do so for the purpose of helping, not hurting. We need to attain balance as it pertains to being tender hearted, yet willing to work, willing to fight, willing to stand if we must. In opposition, to our friends, our families, our relatives, our neighbors, or maybe a total stranger. Because truth may be compromised and lost. We need to be positively teaching the truth and negatively opposing error. We need to be promoting the saving gospel as well as set for the defense of the gospel, standing against that which is the attacks against it. We need to be respect, representing Jesus Christ and rejecting the world and things of the world. We need to, be, need to be children of light and no longer involved in darkness. We need to be obedient to the, to the Father, the Heavenly Father, and rejecting the way of sinful men. And many, many other statements that are made in this, the Holy Bible and the New Testament the perfect law of liberty under which we live, of which we will stand one day and face in judgment. What is the Lord's word? Oh, I can't tell you in a single word or a single sentence. But all of these things that Christians of the first century were admonished to do and lived and the church grew. Souls were saved. People prepared for eternity. And they did that because of their faith, their allegiance to the Son of God, the Almighty Father, His Holy Word, His inspired way that we hear about. And we must do just like they did. You see, if I do today what they did then, I can be today what they were then. New Testament Christians. About the Father's work. I'll close with this thought. Remember... The Savior, at age 12, parents went to Jerusalem. They left. You know the story. He was left behind. They didn't know that he wasn't with the group. A day's journey away and they recognized, where is he? You can just imagine the fear, even the parents, and their reaction. But then they found him after a significant amount of time looking for him. And that infamous statement, that beautiful statement, that great attesting to what he was here for. When he asked them, wished you not that I would be about my father's business? We, as the people of God, must be about our father's business.